Hey, Parks and Rec fans, Rob Lowe here. Did you know that Parks and Recollection is back? And that's not all. We wanted to shake things up a little bit, sort of give us some new life. So my buddies, Jim O'Hara and Greg Levine, are going to be hosting the podcast. That's right, Rob. It is me, Jim O'Hare, and I played Larry, Terry, Gary, Jerry, Barry on Parks and Rec, and I am so excited to go on this adventure with Greg. Uh, And you know me, Greg Levine, Parks and Rec writer, Jim, and I are continuing in the Parks Recap tradition, going through every episode, starting with season four. Yes, we are. So make sure to subscribe to Parks and Recollection wherever you get your podcasts. I am literally so excited. When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or Visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is my friend and yours. And together, we say to you, if you change, well, we will love you anyway. Here is the captain. If I can change, you can change, everyone can change. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are sipping on some Red Bird Ale from the good folks at Portsmouth Brewing Company in Portsmouth, Ohio. Red Bird is a classic steam ale brewed with roasted caramel malts that are perfectly paired with three different domestic hops. Red Bird Ale is full flavored and has a beautiful color, so show it off and pour it into your favorite glass. Garage grade three and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And let's give some thanks and praise to our friends for helping us fill up the fridge this week. First up, a shout out to Carolyn, our friend and the midday show host on 92.5 The River, Boston's independent radio. Cheers to you, Carolyn. And a big uh, We Like Your Jib goes out to Tim Stratton and Timothy Stratton Jr. And last but certainly not least, Captain, we have Heather from Draper, Utah. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to our website, truecrimegarage.com, clicked on the pint glass, and that helped us out with this week's beer fund and filled up our old garage fridge. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, Beer Run. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter especially at Twitter, at TrueCrimeGarage.com. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This week, we have a strange missing persons case on tap for you in the garage. Strange may not be the best description, as I think most would agree that most, if not all, missing persons cases would fall into the strange category. But this one is layered with plausible theories. Some have told me that this is the story of the ghost by the water. But how did that ghost come to be? Some say the ghost is the ghost of a man who went missing 
years ago. On a hot July night back in 1996, Rob Money left his home and jumped into his cherry red Firebird. He pulled out of his driveway and drove down the road. Nothing was particularly out of the ordinary about that at all, except he did not come home. Later, friends and family decided the best thing to do was to notify the police. And then it became official. Rob was missing and police and others were looking. What they would find is his cherry red Firebird, parked all alone at a nearby body of water, Hoover, also known as Hoover Reservoir. His car was parked near the dam. There were no obvious signs of a struggle, and at his house, police found the same. But Rob was gone. The fun-loving 29-year-old seemingly had vanished into thin air. In some cases, some might say vanished without a trace. But remember the layers. When one starts to peel back the layers, one will quickly find traces of Rob. Some have even said that the ghost by the water is a trace of Rob. Rob went missing in the summer of 96. In June of 1997, several teenagers, all recent high school graduates, were over by Hoover Reservoir late at night, drinking beers and passing a joint, celebrating their graduation and the start of what would possibly be the best summer of their lives yet. It was past midnight and it was starting to get chilly when one of the 18-year-old boys spotted what he thought was a spirit walking or floating just near the shoreline, yards off in the distance. Some of the boys agreed that they had seen something that they could not explain. At least one of the boys thought that maybe it was just the joint and the beers and their minds were playing tricks on them. In the end, not all could agree if they had seen something or not. And the ones that believed that they had, in fact, seen something were not quite sure what they had seen. But a few of the boys who would later swear that they did in fact see something out of the ordinary remembered the man who went missing the year before. They remembered that the missing man's vehicle was found not terribly far from their party spot on that late summer night. And so it was like that. Rob Money, the fun-loving 29-year-old with a flashy fast car, became something of folklore, an urban legend about a ghost and a man who went missing from a safe, middle-class suburb late one summer night. This is the case of Rob Money, and this is True Crime Garage. Robert Stephen Money was born April 5th, 1967 in Nelsonville, Ohio. That's in Southeast Ohio. The Money family was a family of five. Mom, Dad, Rob's older brother, and his sister. At some point during Rob's childhood, the Money family moved from Nelsonville, Ohio, up north to Westerville, Ohio. Westerville was and remains a nice and safe suburb of the capital city of Columbus, Ohio. Rob, his brother, and several of Rob's buddies growing up were way into motocross. Not just as weekend warriors, but Rob, his brother, and some of their friends raced dirt bikes in competitions and possessed the ability to work on the bikes themselves. In fact, Rob would go on to take several more technical classes in high school, all related to the automotive field. Rob fell for a girl at a young age. Her name was Angela. The two were close. Their families, in fact, were close. Rob's mother and Angela's mother go way back. And after high school, 
the two got married. Rob and Angela got married. Rob went to work for a construction company. He was a big machine heavy equipment operator for a successful local company. At some point, the two moved into a nice house that they rented. The house was over 1,200 square foot and was not just in the quiet part of Westerville, but it was over by the water, so a very desirable location. The address was 1279 Central College Road. Now, as we said, Captain, Rob was an equipment operator. This is for the Smith Excavating Company operating off of Scioto Darby Road. Rob had worked for them for nine years, and he was known to be a hard worker. He was extremely reliable and rarely missed work. That fact, Captain, will be one of several reasons that the alarm will be raised quickly later when he goes missing. So Rob, to me, seems like a pretty simple guy, but interesting guy. He has, has he does have hobbies. He has a need for speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he just seems to be a guy that, you know, get, got married and he's a hard worker and he's building a life for himself. Yeah. And that's one thing that jumped off the page to me here too, Captain. I made a note that Rob was 29 when he goes missing, but he was working for the same company for nine years. So yeah. that's a very good work history for his age, kind of old school. Now, a few things of importance take place the year before Rob disappears. So he goes missing in 1996. So let's go back to 1995 real quick. So one of those things that I believe to be important is Rob buys a brand new cherry red Firebird. Two, at some point in 1995, that year, Rob and his wife Angela split up. Now, there are a couple of different reasons or stories that, that may be why or the way that the two split up. I asked a few people why the two decided to call it quits. And the thing is, people closest to him and her did not seem to have any real hardcore proof or understanding as of why the two split up. Growing in different directions. Right. So usually what we see is when, when you have a messy split, People were pretty well aware, or there's all kinds of reasons why a couple broke up. But the way that I think that this thing worked out is that I was told that the two of them, that that for reasons just pretty much between the two of them, that it just didn't work out. The best I could sort out, Captain, is that it was pretty a pretty clean, mutual, and amicable separation. Right. One of Rob's closest friends believes that the two split because Rob, even at the age of 29, was still very much living like a 21 or 22-year-old guy, a responsible 21, 22-year-old guy, but not like a dude that is going to be turning 30, right? Right. So maybe, maybe a certain clock is ticking for Angela that wasn't ticking for Rob, and the two decided to not continue to spend their lives together. Everything I could find, everybody I spoke to all had the same account of Rob, the same report of Rob. He is a guy that works hard. He's living for the weekend and his weekends are full of hanging out with his buddies who are a little rough around the edges. By most reports, Captain Rob is a happy, go lucky, hard working, work hard, party hard kind of guy. But if you're into the hobby of cars, whether it's race cars or just just regular cars, that is a hobby that you could spend a lot of time on the weekends. So that could be something where it's like if you're working really hard on the weekdays and spending your whole time on your hobby, that might get in the way of having a healthy relationship. Now, another thing of importance in regards to 1995 is Angela, Rob's wife, not only do they split up, but she moves out of the house that they were renting together. Rob decides to stay at the house, and as we said, it was a nice house in a good location, so affordable rent, no reason to move out. He decides to stay, and a friend of his who I believe is two years older, maybe a couple years older than Rob's, moves in with Rob. So Rob's roommate, his name is Ron. We do need to point out, though, that when Rob goes missing, 
it is my understanding that no one has officially filed for divorce yet. So a divorce was going to happen, but Rob was busy and Angela was busy. And by all accounts, they got along. So it sounds like there was no hurry on anyone's behalf. All right. So do we think we're all squared away on the life and events leading up to our time in question for Rob Money, Captain? Yeah, I think I got a pretty good grasp of who Rob is and who his friends are. And so let's get to the events of July 1996. This is the month that Rob goes missing. So let's go through the newspaper articles because this will set it up nicely for us to dive into. Most of these articles will be from the big local paper here. That is the Columbus Dispatch. This first one is from Sunday, July 21st. So this is, to be clear, five days after Rob was last seen and three days after he is reported missing to police. The headline is, Police have car, few other clues, missing Westerville man. And the article reads, Westerville police have few clues in the disappearance of a 29-year-old man who was last seen Tuesday at his home. Rob Money of 1279 Central College Road was reported missing Thursday after his roommate and friends said they hadn't seen him and did not know where he was. This is according to Lieutenant Don Richardson. The night the report was filed, police found Money's car less than a mile from his home near a concession stand at Hoover Dam, just off Sunbury Road. This is according to police. A park ranger at the dam listed in a logbook that the car had been parked there since Tuesday, police said. Quote, it's a situation where there's not a lot to go on, but it's out of the ordinary because no one seems to be able to give us any information about where he could have gone, end quote. So you're saying this is a park and there was a concession stand at the park and his car has been parked there for now several days. That's correct. And that's according to police. Now, Moni's wife, Angela, reported him missing. The car was found at the dam. This, is, again, is a 1995 Firebird. It was registered in her name. So that's how they know to contact her when the vehicle is found. And they're asking anyone with information to call Westerville police detectives. So let's go exploring through the information here. The first things that I was interested in, in this case, was who and when was Rob reported missing by? And I wanted to know about the car situation. Right. So who and when was Rob reported missing? Well, we know that from the article, Rob was reported missing on Thursday. This article says Thursday night, but I have other reports, Captain, that say that it, that it was Thursday daytime. And it's not super important, but I'm going to go with the daytime reports as that is what is most stated the most in this case. In fact, this is the only report that says the missing report came in at night. Now, more so, Captain, I was interested in who reported Rob missing because we have a smattering of persons who one would expect could report him missing. We've got Rob's wife while separated. That seems still seems appropriate. We have Rob's parents. They live in town, and by all reports, Rob was close with his parents, especially close with his mother. In fact, many of Rob's friends knew Rob's family quite well. And probably the person that makes the most sense to report him missing, other than his work, would be Rob has a roommate. Correct. So I was a little confused by this because other reports state that Rob's mother was the one to file the missing persons report. And as you said, we got the roommate. That would make the most sense. But remember, his friends are close with his family, his parents. Right. And so I was able to confirm with the detective that Rob's wife, his mother, and roommate pretty much worked in concert to report him missing. So they are all checking with each other. Have you seen Rob? Where is Rob? And then based off of the fact that none of the three had seen nor heard from Rob, that it's time to call the police. 
So Rob is reported missing, and his car, the red 1995 Pontiac Firebird, is reported missing as well. Now, that's a good segue here, Captain, because I was fascinated by this car situation, as I think anyone should be, whether we're talking about a missing persons case or a homicide case. We want to know how the car got to where it was found and by who, who got it to where the car was found. This is all going to be incredibly important to our case. So what do we learn here, Captain, from the article? The car was found by police. This is a great start to our investigation. And the topper is the park ranger in their log and notes. They recorded that the vehicle had been there since at least just after midnight or so on the 17th. This is key too. We have the car being found by police relatively quickly. We know that they speak to the park ranger and they can confirm that this vehicle appears. They first see it in the lot shortly after Rob is last seen. And what I like about this information here, Captain, is that it's not some random person that found the vehicle and maybe moved it or said what state that they found the vehicle in. This is law enforcement. To be very clear here, the thing that makes it even better is the law enforcement agency that's investigating him being missing is the same agency that finds the car. This makes it very clean. So just to put this picture in more of a clear light, right? So I'm trying to follow what you're stating. So Rob is seen at work, comes home, leaves home, seen by neighbors leaving home. Later, his car is going to be seen at this park and noted by park rangers. We have this car. It's it's parked here. And this is just hours after Rob was seen by his neighbors leaving his house. That's correct. So I, I'm kind of working backwards here from the time that he's reported missing. But and based off of the, the article itself. Now, I spoke to... Uh, f- a handful of people that are very close to this case. And I was hoping to talk to a few more, but have not heard back from them yet. But from what I could find all the people I did talk to captain in my batch of questions, I started off by saying, I would like to know more about Rob's car. How was it found and by who? So we already know, and we've already answered that question. The other questions I had were, was the car locked? Were the keys in it? Was the car neatly parked neatly in a parking spot? Was there any damage or concerns like a dead battery or flat tire or flat tires? Right. What we learn here and reminder, one of the very cool things, I can't emphasize this enough that we have here in this case that we rarely have in other cases is that police found the vehicle. So it's not altered or moved or anything by someone else who we just have to take their word for it. It's Westerville Police 2, the investigating agency that finds the vehicle. And here's the information about the the vehicle. So the vehicle was found parked neatly in a parking spot. There was no damage or concerns to the vehicle. There was the the battery was fine. The, The tires were fine. The vehicle was operable, right? And it was not locked. And the keys were found in the vehicle. Do we have any sign of struggle, though? No, no signs of struggle at the vehicle and no signs of struggle at Rob's home either. Hmm. And the thing that that makes this even more interesting to me, Captain, is that, you know, these parks typically close at, at dusk. You know, the, the, they may have a, a time, but most of them close at dusk. Yeah, and it's, it's actually illegal to be there and you can be arrested for that. And I don't have an exact time, but I think later we'll be able to narrow it down even more. We cannot, all of these years later, say what time that vehicle arrived to that parking lot. What we can say is when the park ranger first noted it in their log, which would be sometime after midnight on Wednesday. So Tuesday, he's last seen. Wednesday, park rangers note that his vehicle is found sitting parked in their in their parking lot. Thursday, he's reported missing. And around that same time, 
in a very short period of time, police find his vehicle. Now, is it happenstance that they find his vehicle very quickly? It could be. But the other thing we need to point out is we talked about this in the trailer a little bit. This is a cherry red 1995 Pontiac Firebird. Yeah, it will stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, and, and Rob goes missing in 1996. This is a new car. Yeah. This is a, 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 a very new car. This is a, a head turner. And the parking lot for, if anybody's ever been to Hoover Reservoir, mm -hmm. there's multiple parking lots because there are several boat launches. There's also the dam there. There's trails there. It's five square miles of water. There's multiple parking lots, most of them off of Sunbury Road, which is the road that anyone would take west of Rob's house to get to his house. That's the only road that leads to the road that he lives on if you are west of his home. Now, I'm a pretty good athlete. I'm not a super athlete, Captain, as you know, but I could stand on Sunbury Road and punt a football uh -huh. And it land on the property where Rob's house once stood. Two out of three times or one out of 10. Or Nine out of 10, baby. Nine out of 10. So his home was not terribly far from Sunbury and Central College Road. Now, this parking lot where his car was found is, ex like I say, extremely visible from Sunbury Road. It's... You can't miss it. You, I mean, you turn off of Sunbury Road, and within eight yards, you are in the parking lot, and it's not a huge parking lot. So what I'm getting at, Captain, is it could be happenstance that they found his car that same day in a relatively short period of time. It could also be they were either traveling to or from Rob's house after the missing persons report was placed, and because that parking lot is so close to his house, on the way there from Westerville Police Department, they likely spotted his car just because they know to be looking for his car, and it's right there. I mean, it's the reports will say, the newspaper reports will say that the vehicle was less than a mile from his home. I drove from his lot to where the car was found. It's at most 0.3 miles from his home, probably under 0.3 miles. I mean, so many things that are strange. Again, this is a couple minute walk from his house. This park is, but you leave your new car there. No damage, no sign of a struggle. And the keys are in the car. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Hey, Parks and Rec fans, Rob Lowe here. Did you know that Parks and Recollection is back? And that's not all. We wanted to shake things up a little bit, sort of give us some new life. So my buddies, Jim O'Hara and Greg Levine, are going to be hosting the podcast. That's right, Rob. It is me, Jim O'Hara, and I played Larry, Terry, Gary, Jerry, Barry on Parks and Rec, and I am so excited to go on this adventure with Greg. Uh, and you know me, Greg Levine, Parks and Rec writer, Jim and I are continuing in the Parks recap tradition, going through every episode, starting with season four. Yes, we are. So make sure to subscribe to Parks and Recollection wherever you get your podcasts. I am literally so excited. If you're looking for an easy way to ensure your children reach their full potential, IXL is the perfect learning program for you. IXL is the most comprehensive online learning program for K through 12, covering math, language arts, science, and social studies. On IXL, you'll find interactive practice problems, videos, lessons, and games organized by grade and subject. As your child uses the program, they'll get detailed explanations of new concepts, awards to celebrate hard work, and recommendations of topics to practice to close knowledge gaps or build on what they are learning. Memberships start at $9.95 a month, so it's much more affordable than a private tutor. And as a parent, you'll get meaningful reports on your child's progress. 
Studies nationwide have shown that students who use IXL are scoring higher on test. I've had several family members use, enjoy, and excel with the IXL learning experience. Some were trying to get ahead, some were trying to keep up with the class, and others were continuing their education and learning during the summer break. Plus, you'll save time and money over that of a traditional tutor. For a limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get 20% off IXL membership. Visit IXL.com slash garage today. All right, we are back. Cheers, Captain. Cheers. Here's the next article that we have. This one's titled, Year Later Family Lives for Missing Man's Return. This is by Adrian McGee, dispatch reporter from July 16th, 1997. This article reads, Although it's been a year since her son disappeared, Jackie Zeppert of Westerville hasn't given up hope that he'll someday walk through her door. Quote, it's a terrible thing to not even know if somebody is dead or alive, she said. Westerville police have investigated every possible lead into the disappearance of Rob Money and have nothing new to go on, said Detective Mike Shaheen. Money of 1279 Central College Road was in the process of divorcing his wife, Angie, when he disappeared. That's what the article said. Again, everybody I spoke to is, yes, they were in the process of this, but nobody was really submitting paperwork or really doing anything. It was something that they were all going to get to eventually. Right. This article reminds us that his car was found at Hoover Dam. Well, and also that there could have been some money involved because if I don't know if they own this house together, but a lot of times the judges- They were renting. Okay. So maybe they didn't have a lot to split up, but if they were going to get lawyers or if there's paperwork, there still might have been some fees and they might have just been like, hey, we, we don't hate each other. No rush. Neither one of us are in, ru- in a rush to get remarried. So we'll take our time on this. Yeah. And I can't emphasize enough that everybody I spoke to basically had the same suspicions as to why they split up. That Rob, again, he, he partied pretty hard on the weekends. And that maybe he wasn't maturing or growing up at the same pace that Angela was. And at some point, you're approaching 30. Both of them are 29 years old. At some point, if somebody wants to have a family, you got to start doing that. And it sounds like Rob was happy to be married, happy to be in a relationship. But he, he wanted to be not tied down or held down on the weekends. And that she was moving on and he was moving on and, and nobody, neither of them had any problem with that. And in fact, this is a weird situation too, captain, because these aren't two people that fell in love in their twenties and got married. They knew each other since they were kids. So there, there is a strong friendship there as well. Yeah. And I won't go through the rest of this article because it does not add a whole lot of evidence or, or even anything that we can chew on as far as speculation goes as to what happened to Rob. But the rest of this article is rather sad because what it's talking about is that they are still optimistic. Rob's family that he's that, that maybe he's suffering from amnesia or something weird happened and that he's just going to walk through the door again one day. Uh, And that's what they're all hoping and praying for. So just kind of a, an article that, that really, circles around the family's heartbreak and sadness. The following article is from the year, the next year, 1998. So now we got two years he's missing. And one thing we learn in this article, which is extremely tragic. You know, we always talk about this captain, how there's these tiny little bits and nuggets of information in these cases that make them all the more sad. And So Rob's mother's birthday is approximately the same date that he went missing. So either the date that he was last seen or the date that he was officially reported as missing. Right. And so she's saying in this article, two years later, we, we do not celebrate my birthday anymore. 
There's nothing to be happy about this time of year or on this day. My my birthday get together, birthday dinner with my family forever canceled because it's it's just nothing but heartache for them. Well, that's a good question though cuz again, the day he goes missing, Rob goes to work, he comes home, the neighbors see him leave. Where is he heading to? Is he going to uh, a family dinner for his mom's birthday? That that's interesting that you say that. So I can fill in the blanks a little bit as to what his day was. As you said, Captain, he went to work on that Tuesday. It's a normal Tuesday, right? He is spotted after work. So he's on his way home and he stopped off at a Kroger store, which is for those that don't live in the area, Kroger is a long standing franchise grocery store. Usually they're bigger stores. He's seen by a friend that he went to high school with. She sees him, actually sees him in line, and we've all kind of experienced this, right? She sees him and goes, hey, Rob, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. And it's the old chit-chatty stuff. He goes, I'm just trying to stay out of trouble. How you doing? And she I said, like to go, mind your own business. <laughs> I don't know you, lady. Yeah. Um, but she says that he, he seemed typical Rob, very normal. Looked like he had just had a, a a long day at work. Right. He's standing in line and he's got just a small amount of groceries with him. She actually notices that he has some steaks. Mm. Well, this this was one of the things of the story that I found to be rather strange. The reports with Rob, the police have kept a lot of stuff close to the vest. Now, the thing here is some of this information will trickle out over the years, and some of it is being chosen by police to be released to the public as the years go on. And one of the things that we learn after he's been missing for a couple of years is not only was he seen leaving his home, but we get a little more information about that. So he's seen leaving his home by his next door neighbors. And they tell police, like, he, Rob would come and go that we didn't think anything was out of the ordinary. He didn't leave in a hurry. He, we didn't see anybody with him. There was nothing strange about him walking out, hopping in his car and backing out of the driveway and, and, and driving off. Now, what is strange to police and later to Rob's roommate. So Rob's roommate, Ron was at work that night. Old Ron and Rob. Ron and Rob, it gets That's difficult the, the, to tell the story. Those are the people that 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 happens to me. Like you know, if if I have a boss, it's it's a Don and Rod, but because they're so close, you're like, is it Ron or Rod? And so for years, you work with these people and go, is it Ron or Rod? Which one is it? So Ron is at work that night, and this is confirmed by his employer, by time cards, and confirmed to me by the current detective on the case. His roommate, Ron, is not somebody that the detectives are concerned with. Now, what is curious here, though, Captain, is we would later learn that not only did Rob, our missing person, leave his home that night, he left a half-eaten steak dinner on the kitchen table that night. And... We, I thought the steak dinner thing was a little strange because I cannot for the life of me think of one time that I, and I look, everybody's different. Not everything has to be relative to my world, but I cannot think of one time that I ever cooked a steak by myself. And so when I first heard that, oh, there's a half eaten steak dinner on the table, I, I kept thinking there had to have been somebody else at that house with him that night. Mm. but well no because i've cooked steak by myself a lot exactly not everything has to be relative to my world i did ask a few people the same thing and they agreed with me they couldn't think of a time that they ate a steak dinner by themselves well that's because they're not living life right but But, a couple questions here though one is the is the new car that the car the car that's found is that the only car that he has no so he also has a like a small older work truck right 
And I can't say what he was driving that day. All I can say is that the neighbors saw him getting the way that it's described to me is the two neighbor ladies who live on the same side of the street as Rob saw him get into his vehicle, his, his Pontiac firebird back out of the driveway. And he heads East on central college road. And I think this is of significant importance because to get to the parking lot, we said how close it was to his home 0.3 miles or less from Rob's home to the parking lot where his car was found. You would go West on central college to get to that parking lot. Mm -hmm. So he appears to be heading, not appears to be, he is heading in the opposite direction of where his vehicle would later be found. Another very tricky thing here, captain is this steak dinner business half eaten steak dinner. So that like would suggest to me that he left abruptly. He left unexpectedly. Right. And so what would cause him to leave unexpectedly? Well, you could think maybe he, maybe somebody had it out for him and showed up to the house and forced him to leave. But again, we have the neighbors saying they see him by himself. So we know the roommate is at work. This is either old time got away from me and I had somewhere that I had a, a prior engagement or meeting that I arranged and, oh, I got to leave all of a sudden, or he got a phone call, a phone call that inspired him to get up and leave his meal and leave the house. Now let's take this a few steps further. Let's do that. What we would later learn, and this is something that, that I don't believe has been publicly stated, but I've had many people tell me this is that they found a glass of Kool-Aid in the freezer. So picture this, it's a hot July day. He's sitting at the kitchen table. He's got his drink. He's got his meal. He's having dinner after working all day. Something causes him to get up mid meal and leave. But before leaving, he gets up and he puts the Kool-Aid in the freezer. To me, that tells me that he thought that wherever he was going, he would not be there very long, that he would be returning to finish his meal, get his drink out of the freezer and go about his night. And I know we can speculate on every little tiny thing, but you could also go with the idea that obviously we both agree that this unfinished steak is more of a sign of some kind of interruption into the dinner. And is it possible that somebody calls him, he answers the phone, and then as he's putting stuff away, he's putting it back away in the wrong spot because he's just trying to get out of there. No, I I think that he he is setting things up so he can return to his meal minutes later. Right. Right? It's a hot summer day. I don't know if if they got air conditioning. I don't know if the windows are open or what's going on at the house. Right. Hot summer day, you leave the hot meal on the table. You put your cold drink in the freezer so it's cold when you get back. And he leaves the house, takes obviously takes his car keys because we know he drove the car. His wallet is found at the home. Another thing that would suggest that he he does not intend to be gone long, does not need his wallet wherever he's going, and believes that he would be returning soon enough to sit back down and relax and finish his dinner and, and go about his night. And we're assuming that law enforcement has his call log to his house that night. Yes, 100%. I, w- I would make that assumption. Um I don't know the details of that call log. I don't know if, if a call was received that night that caused him to leave. I don't know that they know the number. I mean, we've talked about this in, in, in the past that many times calls were not being logged or information being kept unless there was reason to bill for that call. Um, that they just simply did not keep that information. And, So what we have here, Captain, is 
trying to zero in on why this 29 year old man left his home that evening. And the thing here that we need to point out is that police would later say it's on the two year anniversary of when Rob goes missing that we learn some more information. So police, Westerville police are basically saying in a news article that they've dismissed suicide and running away and that they have a large number of leads that simply came to a dead end. They police are saying in this article, we have reason to believe foul play is why this man is missing. And in fact, in this article, they go on to say that nobody just drops off the face of the earth. Westerville police say they have a suspect. But, quote, we have absolutely zero evidence of any criminal acts at this point. They go on to reiterate some of the things we've already covered in this article here, Captain. Money had worked for nine years operating heavy equipment at Smith and Associates Excavating. He, he had a five-year marriage to his childhood friend from Nelsonville, Ohio, which led to a separation several months before his disappearance. His 1995 Pontiac Firebird was last seen by a neighbor leaving Money's home in Westerville at 9.30 p.m. July 16, 1996. Two days later, the vehicle is found unoccupied in the lot near Hoover Dam, and he's reported missing. They also state here Hoover Reservoir was dragged and searched by Columbus police divers, and nothing was found. His mother in this article says, there is only one person that I know of that would have any animosity toward Rob, but without any proof, I can't actually point a finger. Police agree with Rob's mom, saying, quote, I think very likely he knows that he's the suspect, Detective Richardson said. What police need, he added, is someone to come forward with more information. Read the listeners that quote you were showing me from Rob's mother. Yeah, this one is a is a a heartbreaker here. Quote, the thing that's so hard is not to know what's happened to our son. This is my son and I love him and I want him back. End quote. And the detective in the article goes on to say that had police learned sooner of the victim's disappearance, the outcome might be different in this case. Quote, we immediately started out in a hole. Okay, so Some good stuff to explore here in this article, right? Police say, quote, I think very likely he knows that he's the suspect. Well, this is very telling. Not only do we have a suspect, but two key words used in the statement, he and the. So we know that the the police's suspect is a male. And the word the implies that he is the only suspect, that he is the prime suspect suspect. And why would they have a suspect when you also have police at this juncture? And again, they're, they're keeping a lot of stuff close to the vest. The, the steak dinner doesn't come out for a couple years. The Kool-Aid in the freezer placed there by Rob before he leaves the house doesn't ever come out as far as I've been told. That's all information that, that was gathered from people that were looking for Rob, that were close to Rob stuff that was discussed by police with them. And so we we know that when people go missing or let's say somebody's murdered, you have that question that's everybody goes, well, it's such a cheesy question, they, but they have to ask it. It's the, the age old question of police and detectives asking everybody in Rob's social circle and his family and friends and people that he works with, Do you know anyone who would want to hurt Rob? Of course they ask that question. They have to. And guess what? In this situation, the same name kept coming up over and over again, again and again, the same name. Do you know anybody that would want to hurt Rob? And police are constantly told by many people 
the same name again and again and again. We've been looking into cases for a long time now, and there's normally some similarities, but th- there's some different stuff here. Th- mm-hmm. That's what makes this one so fascinating. One, his car is found relatively close to his house. Keys are in the car. Very strange. But normally when you have a missing person, you get you get a lot of, is there anybody that would want to hurt this guy? And you get a lot of no's. This mm-hmm. one, opposite. Uh, but then police have a pretty interesting statement in this where they say they're starting the investigation in a hole. Yeah, I think that, too, is a very telling statement by police. Right? Detective Richardson said, had police learned sooner of the victim's disappearance, the outcome could have been different. We immediately started out in a hole. This has to mean a couple of things. Most people don't go around killing people. And I have had several detectives, and you have too, Captain, over the years have told us in several cases that that end up going cold. You know what? We ended up with a really good suspect. However, we didn't know that the person had been killed for a month or so after the murder because the body was concealed. Or we didn't know that the person went missing because they weren't reported for a couple of days. Those detectives have constantly told us the same things over the years. Had we known right away that we had a suspect, if we could have talked to our suspect that night or the next morning, we probably would have got a confession or at least got them to fumble and deliver some statements that could have leads or information or evidence in those statements to us. However, the suspect in those cases was able to collect themselves, was able to put together a story. More importantly, was able to hide evidence. And in this case, the biggest piece of evidence is Rob Money's body. Whoever's responsible for Rob disappearing had an opportunity to get rid of Rob's body. Join us back here in the garage, same bat time, same bat channel, and until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.